Okay. Wow. Welcome to, the, to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Kim Brown, and today I'm going to be talking to Judy Radigan, who is one of the co-leaders for GAG Massachusetts. Yay. So welcome, Judy. Can hey, you thank you for uh, inviting me. This is great. This is going to be wonderful. Absolutely. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself? So I teach high school uh, algebra two and geometry. I've taught algebra one a little bit, but I primarily teach algebra two and geometry at Lewiston High School in Maine. And I've been here 21 years, 21 wow. years. I have now moved to a position where I'm developing, developing a blended math class and it's moving slowly, but we're trying to figure it out. It's going to be where every, um, any student who has fallen behind can come to a lab and work on their standards. And um, it's very nice because we're kind of inventing some new way of um, helping students collect up themselves so that they can graduate. So. Wow, that sounds fabulous. Mm -hmm. So you told me a story uh, when we spoke earlier about a high school geometry class that you had when uh, you were in school and you had no grades and it was part of your school's reg regular education program. Can you tell us a little bit about what that was all about and what it was like? It was scary. Uh, the very first test, he said, you better work very hard and make sure to get the highest grade you can because that's the only grade you'll get all year because I'm not grading anything else. And I was shocked. I was like, no way. But I know how to study. So I studied and I got a 98, uh, you know, up there. Really nice. I was very happy. You know, 100's okay. But 98 was very good. I'm like, okay, 98 for the rest of the year. I'm cool. And... um you know, he, he graded, it was great. I was thrilled and we go along and um, we had tests, we had classes, we had this and I kept getting that 98. 98. <laughs> and I was just like, it's 98 again. I'm going to kidnap bin 98. So I started grading my own tests. I found out <laughs> if it was really 98. So here I was taking tests and grading my own tests to find out that they weren't really 98. <laughs> and I, it was funny because it was in geometry and that's my favorite subject. And um, I, ju I just love geometry. I, I, I really have no fear of it whatsoever. So I'm wondering if that, that um, definitely affected my choice in going into education and what I wanted to teach. I yeah, it definitely sounds like it influenced you. And the fact that you did your own grading, you know, just... <laughs> That's that's really interesting. The motivation. No, I, I, yeah, I said this one was a ninety-five. Wait a minute, that was an eighty. I should have gotten. <laughs> what did I do wrong? And then I correct them. It was just yeah. A wow. Different way to get students, you know, to involve them. Absolutely, I love that. So you also told me about a story of being involved in a PACE program while you were in high school. Can you explain to us what that was all about? That was a, a unique program that they, uh, they advertised by having, they had a, um, everybody, all the school met and we listened to a man talk about a program where students could uh, learn at their own pace. And that's why they called it the PACE program. Okay. And it was structured very differently. It was structured uh, primarily with counselors. So it would be 15 students per counselor. And you spent every day with that counselor and um, to, did different types of um, social, emotional learning. Uh, brain control was one of the things. We read psychology books with them. We talked about um, classes and the classes varied according to the student. It was individual. He would meet with us individually. And um, it was just, it was completely, you know, whatever you wanted. There was a girl there who was a ballet dancer and needed to ballet, needed to practice ballet eight hours a day, couldn't go to wow. high school. So she went to a junior college and got all her credits from for high school or junior college. And it was perfectly fine. And then there was somebody else who was sick and had to stay at home. And they they just adapted the curriculum or whatever they needed to that. I had the opportunity to teach. And uh, my daughter, my friend and I, we said, oh, let's teach Edgar Allan Poe. And we went and we got Never Bet the Devil Your Head and The Pit and the Pendulum. And of course, we read The Raven. 
And uh, my sister and my brother were in the class and it was a lot of fun. We met, we read, and we we made up tests and wrote things. It was just a, a lot of fun. But um, and, and my brother uh, learned about puppeteering and he presented oh, wow. puppet shows to the program and he thoroughly enjoyed that. And my sister ended up taking a class on etiquette, um, seeing as that this program um, attracted the very different students who tend not to come to school and tend to do things awkwardly. An etiquette class was very odd. So, but she really enjoyed it. They learned which spoon was for which and their final project, they went to a fancy restaurant and talked about it and videotaped which spoon they were going to use for each of the courses that they bought. So uh, definitely a creative uh, way to learn. Absolutely. And all based on student driven Absolutely. interest. Wow. That's really, that's something else. So um, I'd also like to hear about the month that you spent in Mexico and how that has shaped your view of the world. Oh my gosh, that was uh, very exciting. It was, uh, I was a teenager and my sister needed to go to Mexico for a month. She had a little baby and she wanted some help with the baby. She didn't want to have to deal with the baby alone. So they asked me and through the program, I was able to go. So they wanted me to justify academically what I would be doing to keep my grades and keep up with school. Okay. So for English, I had to keep a journal. And for math, I had to keep a budget and costs and have that recorded. And then um, I also was going to have to do a presentation when I returned to the entire PACE program as a final product of this learning experience. Wow. It was, um, I was very happy to go. I enjoyed it and I uh, did a lot of journaling and I took a lot of pictures because I knew I had to do some kind of presentation had not decided on what to do yet, but yeah, was wow. it. very cool. Wow. So how did that shape your view of the world doing that as a teenager? It was, it was, um, it opened my, it opened up the, the fact that, well, when I, we went there, we drove for four hours in a Jeep and then we got on macho and rode on macho two hours. And that was the place we stayed was in the middle of the jungle and a house that had no electricity and no running water and no bathroom. And it just was incredible. It was, it was eye opening. It was gorgeous, gorgeous. And I, 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 I just loved the whole area and everything. Um, it was very, very beautiful, very shocking, very hard to deal without the electricity. That was a little bit odd. Uh, to, uh, they also all spoke Spanish and I was the only English speaker except my sister. Mm -hmm. and, um, Ed, but everybody else spoke Spanish. And um, there was an incident where the, um, they were gonna have to go away. My sister and her husband were gonna leave me there. No electricity, no running water, uh, no bathroom. It was, a, it was a hole, you went. And you hoped nobody else was there, and that's where you went. And and they were leaving you with the baby. They were to leave me to take care of the baby, and the baby hated me because they were all everybody else was spoiling or rotten, and I was <laughs> disciplined her, and I was just overwhelmed, and I burst into tears and didn't stop crying. And they did not know what to do with me. They were beside themselves. I just continued to cry and sob and sob and had no idea. It's like. I can't, they can't do this to me. I can't, I, this will not work. And they tried and tried. So they came up with a solution that they had an, an, an aunt who lived in a city called Colima mm -hmm. and that I could go stay with her for two weeks, but she didn't speak any English. Okay. There was only one person that didn't speak English. Then the problem was with the baby. Should the baby be left on the ranch or should the baby be with me? So they finally decided the baby should be with me. So I went and I stayed with this woman in Colima uh, with um, the niece and uh, had a great time. And it was just, I was so much more um, calm. Yeah. Um, I believe after talking with quite a few people, I went through what's called culture shock. Mm-hmm. 
that it's an actual, that it can be an actual um, physical reaction to a different culture. Uh, I liken it to when you go outside and you camp in the backyard and then you can just go inside, right? Yeah. I, I couldn't go inside. You couldn't do that. Yeah. I had no safety. I had no safety net. And uh, it just, it was like I was falling. So it was, it really frightened me. So when I got to the city, at least it had a bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> then I had running water and then she had electricity. So I felt like I was a little bit, you know, okay. I felt safe. <laughs> it probably makes you um, more uh, able to understand when students come to your building that are from other places. I bet that really. I'm you know. hoping so because we do get a lot, and I just enjoy them coming and and feel for them, thinking here they've come from their country to here, and it's so different. And uh, and you know, I just love helping them, trying to help them. I have not seen any of them ex that have experienced culture shock. Yeah. So um, I'm hoping they didn't have to go through that, and and and. And maybe maybe they have somehow, but it definitely gave, gave me an understanding of the difficulty in leaving your home, yeah, and going somewhere else. Yeah, and like you said, you know, when you're camping, you can just go in the house if you're right. camping in your backyard, and or that camping they for the weekend. For the weekend, yeah. you know, okay, after the weekend, and you have people that can speak your language there. Sure, right. It, you know, when there's nobody that speaks your language, that's much harder. So. Yeah. So you mentioned taking a lot of pictures. And from what I understand, you have a slideshow that yes. you're going to share with us. Yes. So I would love to see that. Can Let's, you share that? That would be great. I'll do that now. Go ahead and present. And I believe I chose a window. Let's see. Okay, here we go. It's coming up here. Yes. So here is the slideshow. It says Pace 1975. Now this is a slideshow that is from 1975. I did learn how to make my own slides, so I made the intro. <laughs> okay. So I'll go ahead and start it off. I'll talk a little bit as it goes. Okay. I started off. They wanted a goodbye picture, so this is my brother saying goodbye. And this is Kalima. And this is the aunt that I stayed with and my sister. The houses in Kalima were just solid walls. And that was a room. And that's inside the house. There wasn't any trees in the street or trees in front yards, no front yards at all. It was all just solid walls with doors and windows. And when you went into the house, this side is the kitchen. And the other side was open to the outside, and there would be trees inside, like a courtyard. Okay. This was a washing basin where you washed your clothes. You scooped up the water and you scrubbed your own clothes. And here I am eating sugar cane, fresh sugar cane, which was pretty exciting. I'd never seen that before. I'm carrying papayas because papayas are from Mexico. So I learned a lot about the culture and about the fruits from there. This is the best tea in the world. I believe it's lemongrass. And this is the, the um, park in Colima. I went quickly because they're just park pictures and, you know, different things. People, the dresses. And that was a uh, march, a woman's march in Colima. This was at the ranch where they carried their laundry on their head. We did a couple pictures on the rocks. That's where we, we washed our laundry at the ranch. We had to wash them in the river and scrub them. I wanted to try to get it focused so you could see my niece in the back with her father. This was the ranch house. And you can see the weed branches and the ceiling. And then what they did was they took cow dung and put it on those branches to make the walls. That woman wow. is grinding cornmeal, and this is the stove made the same way, with weed branches and cow dung. Wow. Uh, this was, they did a, um, a pig roast for us, and that was them doing the pigs. 
this is my uh, brother in law showing off a, a goat. And I keep trying to get the focus because it seems to go in and out every once in a while. And there's my, my niece and my sister, and I'm going <laughs> to feed the goats. Uh, they milked cows. They had cows that they could milk, and that's my niece learning how to milk a cow. Very curious. And of course, that was the spoiled little girl. <laughs> and this woman and I are trying to balance on the rocks in the uh, creek. I, they wanted me to keep standing on rocks to take pictures. And like, that's that has to be, you have to stand on the rocks. <laughs> so that's what we did. We stood on the rocks and got pictures of all of us. And that is my sister, her husband, and his parents. And wow. I thought it was a classic picture. Then we went to Matanillo uh, Beach on the beach and went swimming. And there's my sister and the, the aunt I stayed with. And this is uh, my niece's grandfather. And you can see how sweet she, of course, is, right? And how much they loved her. <laughs> That's just a, there's a tree. And then that is the end. That's it. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. So, all right. Now, you mentioned when you were talking about going to Mexico, about taking pictures and knowing that you were going to have to do some type of presentation. So we now know that what you did was a slideshow, but you didn't know you were going to do a slideshow. So can you walk us through how you went through that whole oh, um, problem solving process? I met, I met with the... Um... My counselor, because I said the counselor is the one that you're constantly engaging with. And I talked to him about the presentation. Did we do posters, use the pictures, do that? And I said, no, I want to do a slideshow. He says, a slideshow? He says, okay, well, go ahead and look into it. Figure out how that's done. And I'm like, oh, what? Okay. So I went to the, you know, a, fo a photo store and I said, how do I do this? And he says, well, it costs this much per slide. I don't remember now what it was, but it cost this much to convert all of those photos into slides. So I calculated and it was much too much money for me to do. And then I needed a projector and then I needed this and then I needed all of this. And so they said, well, what do you think we can do? And I, and I said, I have no idea how to get all this money. I don't have it. And so they suggested I write a grant. So I wrote for a grant from the program and they gave me the money. They granted me the money to purchase or to convert the photographs into slides and uh, the, to purchase that projector. And then I was able to present the, my trip to Mexico to the entire group. And it was nice. It was a nice way to do it. I wasn't, I had no idea any other way to do it. So <laughs> I'm glad I, I chose that and did that. But what a great uh, exercise in problem solving, you know, here you've got this, this idea like, okay, I have to present, how am I going to do this? And, you know, with just a little bit of uh, gentle uh, nudging, it sounds right, like. Right. It wasn't, it wasn't a, you know, how we give students a project. Everybody has to create a poster and everybody has to do this and everybody, it was presentation. What? How yeah. can I present it? It wasn't. You can do this. You can do a Google slide. You can do that. He didn't give me off. He didn't give me suggestions. He just sure. said, how are you going to present it? And I had to figure out how I was going to present it. I mean, now looking back, I think, why didn't I just make posters of all the pictures? And well, I, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. Well, I think your I method was slideshow. definitely um, much better. I mean, look at the things that you learned by doing that. Uh, yeah. You know? I, I learned I, how to make slides. Homemade yeah. slides. They they look terrible now, but they looked pretty good when they were original. The beginning. Oh sure. Paste nineteen seventy five. I learned how to make that. Yeah. And uh, that was a lot of fun to do. So I know how to do that now. Absolutely. That. Yeah. All right. So when you were in Louisiana, you told me that you visited a classroom where the teacher served as facilitator for the students. So can you tell us It was about absolutely that? exciting. It was so exciting. It was an English class and it was, um, I walked in and I met with her and the kids, students were already in there talking as a group. There, uh, there was not a great deal of them. There were about 10, I think, all together. And they 
we're discussing and working and doing things. And she said that she'd already talked to them and this is what they're doing. And what it was is that she was a guide. She uh, showed them their standards. We call them standards now. She showed them the, what they needed to accomplish in there. Mm -hmm. And they chose how to accomplish it and checked with her to make sure that it would go in the right direction. They created their own assessments. They guided the whole thing. And she, they, they decided what to do to accomplish what they needed in order to complete and, um, and to be able to say, yeah, yes, we learned this. This is how we learned it too. And it was just such an experience because she truly just sat there and listened to them. And then every once in a while, you know, if they got a little upset with each other or something that she would just, mm -hmm. you know, guide them gently back and back on track. And, you know, uh, if they needed some help and an idea of how to do something, then she was there to help them. Mm -hmm. It was, um, it was at that time the way I wanted to do my class, but I did math. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Not yeah. yet. I will make it maybe. <laughs> How old were the kids? What grade was it? I think, believe they were seniors. They seniors were, seniors high they were also <laughs> high level class, a high level yeah. class. Well, these students were driven. They did sure. have the initiative and yeah. um, the PACE program had students who were not driven, who did yeah. not have initiative. So those are two opposite groups with a similar, similar kind of, you know, experience. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So another question for you. Um, what about your philosophy of educators teaching more than just a core subject? Because you had said to me, you told me a story about your grocery shopping history lessons and talked about, I struggle in uh, and start subject, but this is how I plan to overcome it. Talk to me about that. Yes, I, 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 it, it came from partially from the, the frustrating deal with a, a lot of teachers telling their students that they don't do math, so don't come to them for math help, or they don't do science, so don't even talk to them about science. And I thought, that's not, you know, I think that, that everybody, we expect students to know this, so I think we need to have a positive attitude towards all anything that we can do. But I knew I personally had a difficulty with social studies and history and especially with dates. I just could not figure out the dates. So I've decided that when I go to the grocery store and the price is something like 1922, I turn around and I say, who knows what happened in 1922? And everybody looks at me like I've lost my brains. <laughs> and history person will look at me kind of quizzically and I say, you know something, don't you? And they say, yeah, this and this or this or this and this happened. And I'm like, oh, wow. So it's been able, it's enabled for me to place World War I and World War II and just a few little things so that it has improved my understanding of history. And um, you did it in a really fun way. That's exactly. so cool. <laughs> yes, I, it might shock some people, but it's been a lot of fun to do. Uh, I think that is so awesome. All right. So to close things out, when you are thinking about your particular high school experience and talking about students today and what you observed when you were in Louisiana, do you think that this is something that could work now with today's generation of students? I believe it's going to take a lot of tweaking. I, I, I look back on it and I, I had short shortcomings. I got a complete scholarship to college. Uh, that was great. Uh, I, I don't know how I got it. I, I, I definitely had to take some tests there. I wasn't sure how, but um, I did struggle in the math when I got to college. So I know I was, I did not have the correct math and I needed some support there to, to have been able to succeed in that, in that college. Mm -hmm. So I know the academics suffered, the science and the um, English and those things. So uh, I believe that I think with some tweaking that it could work mm -hmm. and that it that we should empower students more. For example, I'd like to teach a class called Math My Way. 
And I'm, I'm working at my school right now in this blended math program. And secretly, I'm developing this idea of Math My Way, where students meet all with their own, in their own class, calculus, uh, algebra two, trig, whatever, where they are, because now we're in the computer generation, they can create their own learning for that math. And with all the resources on the internet, they can create their own experience. And I would just be there with the different standards to say, look, where's this? You don't have this put in there yet. Where's that? And, and have them, you know, demonstrate with me the standards as they're going along. So it is, it, to me, I think, I don't think I could teach a class of 30 that. I think it would start with a class of unfortunately five. Sure. To begin the idea. Yeah. And it would take a while to figure out how to do more because, and, and maybe I wouldn't do calculus all the way to algebra one. Maybe just, you know, algebra one and algebra two mm -hmm. or something like that, or algebra one and geometry or something where, you know, and they can work with each other and help each other on the parts. There's so many, there's so many concepts that they're learning in both that why couldn't they combine and, and empower the students to work together more and to learn and to say, I, I understand this. And, and, and I'll say, well, how do you understand it? And it prove to me that you understand it. And I think it would be, I think it's, the, to me, I think it's the future and what we need to do with math and, and making math available for everyone and fun and fun. Wow. Judy, you a just blew dreams. me away. I <laughs> have dreams. loved this conversation. Thank, Thank you, you so much for doing this. Thank I just, you for asking me. Thank you. Yeah, this is fabulous. All right. I am going to stop our recording at this point. Wow. <laughs>